Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. We will start very shortly. We're waiting for two more speakers to come. In the meantime, please get your headsets and let's get prepared for starting. Thank you very much.
1 2 Ercen Duvatri Ercen 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 Duvatri Bir, iki, üç. Bir, iki, üç. Acendi batırı. Hello again. We will start shortly. Please get your um, headsets if you haven't done so yet. Thank you. Test, 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 test. What channel are we on? Which one? So, welcome everybody. Uh, please use these um, headsets. Is this is this working? Yes. Is mine working? Yeah. Uh, channel one. Channel one. Ooh, ooh. No, I don't get channel one. Huh. I don't. Turn it on first. I did. Thank you. <laughs> but it comes from the other room. Uh -huh. Should. Well, anyway, we'll solve that afterwards. For the moment, I'm the one speaking. Differences. Ah, oh, they have. Okay. They have infrared here. Yeah, but this one as well. But it comes from the other room. It's scratchy. I apologize, they don't have the same system in the different rooms and I made the big mistake of carrying one infrared system from one place to the next. So, <laughs> now it should work. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for coming to attend this, uh, this session. 
My name is Bertrand La Chapelle. I am at the uh, International Diplomatic Academy and I am um, also managing a program on internet and jurisdiction. We have a certain number of, um, of panelists today and I would like to very uh, briefly identify the way and describe the way uh, we would like to organize this, uh, this session. We will have a first round of presentations by the, uh, the different panelists and then open the discussion to, to the room. And by the way, I love the, uh, the kind of round table uh, format. This is exactly the, the, the way it should be. Um, the question of uh, free cross-border flow of internet traffic is particularly interesting because of the word cross-border. As you all know, one of the main challenges that we have today is that the borderless technical infrastructure of the internet is giving rise to a large number of not only cross-border spaces with the different platforms, but also a transfer of information that does not follow the traditional geographic paths. And so ensuring that there is free transborder flow of internet traffic is extremely important. I want to make um, a clarification at, at first. Yes, but I need to. I need to make a clarification at first that I think Michael Rothert will, will highlight is the distinction between the technical borderless, technically borderless nature of the internet or non-geographic nature of the infrastructure and the fact that there are borders on the internet in terms of jurisdictions but that they do not match necessarily the geographical borders that we are accustomed to. We'll come back to that later. We will have a succession of presentations and one of the things that I would like from the, the panelists is to highlight from each of their perspective and their point of view what this cross-border challenge represents. And I would like to start with uh, Michael Rothert, uh, which I hope will explain a little bit to us the uh, distinction precisely between this technical infrastructure and the uh, content that flows on it. Michael and each of the panelists, the best thing is if you can introduce yourself at the very beginning and go from there. Michael. Okay, uh, thank you, Bertrand. Um, my name is Michael Rotert. I'm president of the German ISP Association, a trade association, and uh, I'm also uh, speaker for EuroISPA, the European Internet Service Provider Association. I was a service provider myself in the early 90s, so uh, still giving technical lectures. I still know what I'm talking about, but I'm very much related in the last uh, couple of years with uh, regulatory uh, affairs uh, on, on the internet. So that's for the background a little bit. I, I was asked to set a little bit the scene on a technical technical side and to explain technical so that you understand what we're talking about. Um, then let me start from the network it's itself. The internet is a network of networks where the intelligence of the net is on the border or on the edges with the applications and not within the transport systems system. Sometimes people want to interfere the transport system to overcome weaknesses in laws and other things, but that disturbs the technical nature of the net. As ISPs can do and make connection connecting arrangements, they do not care about any borders. One ISP asks an, another one uh, to be interconnected and they don't care if there is a, a national border in between or not. ISPs, uh, in turn, are needed for at least two technical distinct purposes. One is to serve the edge, as I explained before, where the destination system, um, let's say connection to the end user or server or machine is located, and the other set of ISPs 
are managing the transport system irrespectively of the destination. Stakeholders in, in, in this, uh, let's say, um, model uh, of, of the internet as we unfortunately don't have it uh, really uh, uh, through going this, these days, are the carriers. Uh, carriers are those providing the lines. Then you have internet exchanges. Internet exchanges are so-called peering points where a set of internet service providers from the transport system are interconnected to exchange data in uh, um, just to make the data flow as quickly as possible and to manage that the data packets receive, uh, go to the destination as fast as possible. Then uh, beside the internet exchanges, then you have a set of providers. There are different providers, access providers. Um, they give the consumer uh, and um, end user access to the internet and you have a set of special providers um, doing some hosting or uh, delivering content but these providers have of course different obligations uh, according to the nature of their job being access provider or being content or hosting provider. Traffic is normally in the net transported from let's say A to B where A and B are uh, uh, respectively located at the edge of the internet. Traffic um, is also uh, another expression for a set of data uh, consisting of a source address, a destination address, some technical uh, administrative bits and bytes, and then followed by the data, um, followed by the data which we call content and this content is what appears at the edge once the administrative data are taken away and is for instance maybe uh, a, a page on, on uh, in the web browser or maybe an email or whatsoever there are as uh, this and and as you may recognize I, n I never mentioned any borders in between because there are no borders for this type of, of, for, for this data flow because an internet address is sometimes also called IP address. Um, this is where they're looking for. You have uh, different mechanisms. One of the, those are the name server and a name server is only used to translate a name into an IP address and this IP address will then be inserted into the transport system to deliver the data to the end user. Um, you also, when it, when it comes to, um, to talk about uh, uh, free uh, cross-border flow of internet traffic, you find a set of um, different uh, topics. Uh, one of it uh, may be called the packet inspections, but I leave this for the moment until we go further in the discussion, but then you can recall me and I will try to explain this uh, uh, when the time has come. Thank you so far. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. You, you give me um, a, a, nice, um, a nice segue. But before I give the floor to, uh, to Milton precisely to uh, present some results regarding uh, deep packet inspection, um, the important element of from, uh, as Michael explained, is this distinction I was making between the architecture of the internet naming and addressing system, which is not based on geography. Uh, IP addresses can be allocated or not according to geography, but the system itself is not based on borders, unlike, for instance, the postal service, where you have these very nice lines where you have the name of the person, the address of the person, the city, and the country. There's no such thing in the, uh, in the internet that is related to the, um, the um, transport. Milton, can you uh, tell us a bit more about this um, result research, uh, research results on the use of this packet inspection, and particularly in what regard can deep packet inspection on a given territory potentially impact 
the traffic and the exchange of information on other uh, territories and jurisdictions? Sure. Uh, again, I'm Milton Mueller. I'm with uh, the Internet Governance Project at Syracuse University School of Information Studies. Uh, we have a uh, National Science Foundation funded project uh, for the past three years studying the uh, impact of deep packet inspection technology on Internet governance. I wanted to have uh, the website of the Network is Aware project, uh, which was what we call it, the Network is Aware, uh, up on the screen here, but that's very difficult to do without Internet access. <clears throat> However, it's a very simple domain name. Since uh, you all now believe that uh, domain names don't matter, I will tell you the domain name and we'll see how much it matters. It's deeppacket.info, um, and it's even using a new top-level domain, so you can go see for yourself. Now, we addressed a number of applications of deep packet inspection. Uh, basically, you can use it for any kind of application ranging from copyright policing to uh, intrusion detection and intrusion prevention to uh, content filtering uh, and for bandwidth management. And so we've done studies of each of those. Uh, not all of those functions are relevant to uh, transborder problems. Uh, the basic point here is simply that DPI can be a passive surveillance function or it can be a control or bordering function. In other words, uh, if it's passive, the DPI simply recognizes and perhaps makes some kind of a note or quantification or record of what is passing through the network. It does this by scanning the entire packet, including the data content, and recognizing patterns in that content, such as, for example, uh, a known signature of a piece of malware or the signature of a copyrighted file. <coughs> Now, if it's a control or bordering function, then uh, suddenly uh, Bertrand gets interested in it because it is establishing a border point on the Internet. And in some sense, the DPI technology grew out of the firewall technology, which is basically a border within the network that says, what kind of a person or packet are you, and do I want to let you in or out of this network? So. So uh, firewalls and DPI boxes can be bordering functions in a technical sense. Now I'm going to, uh, for, because of the time constraints, give you one simple, well, maybe not so simple, but one example of uh, how the use of DPI seems to have had a cross-border function. Uh, and it has to do with China. <clears throat> now China was one of the first countries to set up uh, mirrored or anycasted root servers. Uh, inside their country. I won't explain what a anycasted root server is, but uh, just let's say it's a root server. And uh, there are three different root servers located in Beijing. And due to routing requirements among our internet service providers, it is possible that a domain name query at the root level coming from sources outside of China might make use of these root server instances in China. Now, what makes this interdependency interesting is that China relies heavily on domain name uh, or content filtering and blocking to implement the so-called Great Firewall of China. So this means that its name servers might modify or tamper with responses to queries about where to find certain domains. And it's probable that they're using deep packet inspection to do this. Now, an incident happened in uh, March of 2010 in which people who lived outside of China, due to network topography, were querying the root name servers hosted in, ch in China. And uh, that query passes through China's Great Firewall. Now, the very excellent uh, technicians who administer China's Great Firewall normally have some kind of configuration that that gives a different response based on whether the query is coming from inside China or outside China. And somebody made a mistake, and that, that uh, discrimination function was eliminated for a, a couple of hours, or more than that, actually, a couple of days. And because of that, people in Chile and California were seeing the Internet as if they were in China and under the great, uh, out in the Great Firewall. 
Can I interrupt you here just to ask you one uh, clarification to explain to people how it comes that somebody who is outside of China may have ended up using this mirror in China? The whole point of having these distributed instances of the root servers is to uh, be more resilient. So uh, if maybe the traffic going headed to one root server is, or the, the facilities going to one root server is blocked or congested, then it would go to another one. And uh, it would uh, indeed, uh, because this is complicated, because of any cast, the, the instance in China, actually the internet thinks that that's in California. Um, so uh, I'm not sure exactly how those packets found you know, their way, but it's, it's a routine part of the way the root server system functions with these anycasted or distributed instances of roots that the queries could come from a lot of different places. There's no you know, fixed point that it goes to. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so that's the first um, illustration of potential transborder impact. Another type of transborder uh, impact of deep packet inspection is, of course, if one country does deep packet inspection on their territory and it actually looks at packets that are corresponding to a communication between two people who happen to be in two completely different countries. As an illustration, there was a, um, a problem a, a couple of years ago between Sweden and uh, Russia, if I remember correctly, where the Russian authorities were concerned that the um, security measures that Sweden had taken were actually exploring in depth the traffic that was going into Russia. So just to illustrate that it's not necessarily the black and white picture that we uh, <laughs> we sometimes have between who is on the right side and who is on the bad side. Um, let me go now to uh, Robert Guerra because he will um, try to explain this notion of upstream filtering and ideally use maybe one example uh, or two. Um, uh, my name is Robert Guerra. I apologize uh, for my voice. I just have a little bit of laryngitis. Um, so I just, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. So first of all, in terms of a short introduction, my name is Robert Guerra. I'm a special advisor to the Citizen Lab, um, which is a center at the Canada Studies for Global Security Studies at the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. Um, the Citizen Lab um, has been working on issues of um, internet governance, cybersecurity for, for a long time. And one of the uh, initiatives that we're a part of that I'll be referring to um, in the course of this session is the Open Net Initiative, and that is a collaborative project that we uh, are, have been working with for, for almost a decade now with the Berkman Center um, and many other institutions that tries to document uh, and enumerate um, internet censorship. Um, and what's very different in the approach that we do is uh, we in fact do a technical interrogation of the network. Um, and actually try to generate the data to not only see if websites are blocked or not, and we actually have that data, um, but um, using sophisticated tools that are run in country where uh, things are, we'll get a sense of not only if a site is blocked, um, but then we'll start doing, um, running technical tools to actually try to see how it's being blocked, um, and then try to compare that with um, um, open source data that's available. Um, um, in terms of your, uh, and so we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, if you look at opennet.net, you'll see a lot of things. Um, what we have seen um, is in terms of up, upstream, um, because we take a look at what, how internet filtering and, and the characterization takes place in different countries, um, what I can do is that um, we have published um, several reports about upstream filtering. Uh, I'll maybe start with the most recent um, and then go kind of go back in time. Can you uh, maybe define uh, uh, upstream, upstream filtering? filtering. And, and it, it'll, in the example, it'll become clear, is that we published a report um, that we called Filtering Gone Wild, or sorry, Routing Gone Wild. And it was uh, a very technical report that's available online on how filtering that is applied by um, ISPs in India uh, were affecting ISPs in Oman. Um, and it's basically because uh, BCP routes and other routes are shared between the two countries. Um, uh, what happens is the, um, when we took a look at the 
the websites that were being blocked in Oman, which we knew, and we know what sites are being blocked in, in India, what we saw is that websites that should not be blocked in Oman, but are blocked in India, um, were appearing as being blocked. And then we, um, you know, kind of saw that. And then in the, in the paper that goes on to great length in terms of why is that the case, the BCP routes and elsewhere, but it's the effect that one country can have on another um, because they get their connectivity or they exchange routes. Um, another um, example, um, going back further in time, and then I'll go one time in the middle, is that this is not something that's recent. And so we've also seen in 2004, um, which it predates the IGF, of um, um, you know, certain countries are close to other countries that block, and the issue of China came up. And so what we've seen is that the, the bandwidth of the connectivity that China has is supplied to some of its neighbors. And so what we, in our study that we did in 2004, is that we found that content and sites that are blocked in China were also appearing in Uzbekistan. And it's because the connectivity was coming from there. And so, you know, this is an issue is that, um, you know, should these things apply or not? And then we'll probably talk about that later. Um, we also found that um, Kyrgyzstan that got um, connectivity from Kazakhstan, sites were being blocked as well. Um, and a more famous example that actually, so these are, you know, one country that's affecting another country. Um, there are issues in regards to, to censorship and what's being used. Um, I won't get into the technical details, but I think something that, that Milton was referring to is that there are some key protocols or ways that things are done in terms of routing. And so a very famous incident um, that took place in 2008 um, is when um, I believe it was the Draw Muhammad videos uh, went online and they were blocked in Pakistan. Um, they um, did not advertise the BCP routes properly and Pakistan blocked YouTube for the world. Um, and so it's in a way that there, there needs to be a, uh, an understanding. There's the technical community that's involved. If they don't do their job properly, they'll have cross-border consequences. I would say when one country um, is getting connectivity from ISPs in another country, are they aware that blocking may be taking place at a national level? Um, these are questions that, that need to happen. And from some of the research that we've seen is sometimes um, ISPs or others are unaware. And so I think it's just, um, you know, though that's not something that's shared a lot, is that um, if one wants to have a free and open internet and peers or have some sort of technical connection with others, be it the DNS part that, that Milton was talking about and elsewhere, there can be consequences. And, and, and one of the things that we keep on saying is that this needs to be far more transparent, uh, far more documented, and the consequences if two countries agrees on a filtering if there's, not that there is, but if there were a European-wide filtering, then it's fine, everyone agrees to it. But if one country has a different set of criteria, it's different. And so I'm really interested to hear from folks uh, that are gonna be speaking after me in terms of, well, what's been done in regards to policy? And so uh, we, I have numerous other um, examples. And uh, for those that are listening online, I have tweeted references to the uh, papers that I had mentioned as well online. And so those are available for those that want to see them in more detail. And I look forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. What I find worthy uh, noting from both the presentation of uh, Milton and, and Robert is that what they're talking about is unintended cross-border impact. There are, there's a whole range of other issues that we could address that are intended cross-border impact. But if I take just this point, it's interesting to see that you have unintended cross-border impact when the technical architecture is somehow meeting the bottlenecks of the physical topology of the network and the topology of the routing. There, there's a sort of uh, contact that is done wrong and the level of awareness as Robert said, is something that is probably not enough uh, among all the, pe the actors who make national decisions without taking into account the potential consequences. Actually, an actor that is particularly well placed to uh, have a sort of overview of the different situations is Google. And um, can I ask Iarla to um, uh, explain a little bit how you see this problem from your perspective? And as a transition to the next part, um, what kind of principles can you see emerging uh, in that regard? Thank you. So um, 
My name is Irla Flynn, and I uh, head public policy for Google in uh, Australia and uh, New Zealand. And um, yeah, I suppose uh, first of all, the I uh, agree with earlier speakers about the global nature of the internet is inherent to its success and inherent uh, to the way it works, and certainly inherent to the way um, uh, Google uh, looks at it. Um, uh, but we're seeing, uh, uh, as we've heard from uh, from the other speakers, increasing uh, examples of, of disruptions to that. Now, uh, obviously, there are the unintended uh, examples, and even just overnight, there's a story in Ars Technica about uh, routing changes by an ISP in Indonesia called Moratel, uh, which apparently blocked Google services in other countries. And according to Ars Technica, uh, this was actually a, a, an intentional uh, effort to um, to block services. That may have something to do according to our, our, our Ars Technica, uh, and I, I can't confirm any of the details. Um, uh, and there's an interesting issue there that something so important, I suppose, essentially is based on trust uh, between the different providers. Sorry, I just, I just want to make one thing clear. Is, is it unintentional or intentional? Uh, according to what I saw, it was, it was believed by Ars Technica to be intentional. intentional so that's okay. their information. It's not my information. Um, Um, and you know that that that's one example of a, an increasing uh, trend that we see. Of course, there are many intentional uh, efforts where governments want to block access for people in their country to services in other countries, uh, and we have very regular examples of that. Gmail was blocked in Iran for a week in September. Uh, access to YouTube is blocked in, in many countries today. Uh, the Innocence of Muslims uh, video may have contributed to a number of recent cases. Uh, we have a growing number of countries who are imposing or looking at requirements to host services locally. So if you want to provide a service in our country, you must also host that, and we don't want the data leaving our country. Uh, an interesting case of that with uh, Kazakhstan last year, uh, and so on. So many, many different um, uh, examples, and I suppose that all adds up to a rather worrying trend, uh, something that, that, that concerns us. Uh, and as we see, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, I suppose the, the growth in, uh, in, in the internet uh, is in uh, primarily in Asia, so China, India, Indonesia, and Philippines, for example, are, are the top four countries around the world in terms of growth of internet users. And there's a big question here about what philosophy will they seek to apply in their public policy uh, to the way the internet works? Uh, will it uh, embrace the openness that, that we believe has contributed immensely to the dynamism of the internet, or, or will they take another view driven by concerns like uh, you know, attempts to protect uh, local culture or, or social values, uh, or indeed around concerns with security? Um, uh, I'll close out by saying, look, we, we think one uh, important way to try to sell the benefits is to frame it uh, in terms of the economic benefits that the internet brings. Uh, and there's a you know growing body of really good research that highlights uh, the benefits that the internet brings uh, in countries all around the world. I just mentioned one report from McKinsey, uh, which uh, looked at the, the contribution of the internet in what they called aspiring countries, uh, around 2% of GDP, which was $366 billion in 2010, so very substantial uh, economic benefits to be had. Uh, and we think that's an important, important framing uh, for debates around these kind of policy issues. Um, one solution uh, that we're seeing emerge uh, is to use trade agreements to try to keep these um, uh, information lanes open. And uh, if the uh, global internet is a key infrastructure uh, for services, then we can view it as sort of the shipping lanes of the future. Uh, and countries uh, cooperate in many cases on keeping those shipping lanes open because every country uh, can see the benefits that, that arise from that. If we can take a, a similar philosophy to the internet, uh, that will be beneficial. So some, some positive uh, trends emerging with regard to trade agreements, and we can come back and talk more about that if you like. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, this allows a transition when we're talking about principles to activities that have been going on in a certain number of international organizations. Um, one of the uh, interesting cases that emerged um, in the um, Arab Spring was the fact that Egypt, as you know, blocked the access to the internet on its territory for a while. However, Egypt is a 
considerable node of transit traffic for all of uh, Eastern Africa, where a large number of cables are going to Eastern Africa. And at no moment, unless I'm mistaken, at no moment has Egypt uh, done any um, tampering with the transit traffic. And you know that in international law, there is a rule that says if the behavior of one actor or certain actors consistently and coherently seem to reflect a sort of implicit principle, this implicit principle progressively can be leveraged and used as a reference in international law. And in that case, there has been an appearance of a principle of non-tempering with transit traffic, which is quite close to the shipping lines um, argument that Yerla was uh, mentioning. I would like now to, to, to give the, the floor um, to um, Matthias Tramer and Anne Carl Blanc to um, address the, uh, the situation and the perspective both on the Council of Europe and on the OECD regarding the principles that could apply to um, uh, transit traffic and, and the use of the internet and cross-border flows, and particularly in the case of the Council of Europe, the uh, no transboundary harm principle that uh, it has pioneered. Matthias. Thank you, Bertrand. Uh, my name is Matthias Dreimer. I'm working, first of all, for the Austrian government as a director of the Media Freedom Information Society in the Federal Chancellery. And I'm very much linked in my work to the Council of Europe. And I want to bring in a little bit from the, let's say, member states' perspective in the Council of Europe um, some point to you. Uh, first of all, I want to say um, that especially this workshop, again, shows how important the convergence of technicians on the one side and human rights lawyers on the other side is. Uh, human rights lawyers are dependent on technicians, that's what I always say, because they have to understand what this is all about. So the real power is in the hands of technicians, first of all. But then technicians should also learn that a lot of so-called technical issues have or always have a human rights dimension. Uh, for us, in the Council of Europe, the situation could be described very simple. When we talk about cross-border flowing information, it's a question of Article 10 of the Convention on Human Rights, which literally guarantees uh, freedom of information to impart information and also to, uh, to accept information and to, to, to s uh, look for information without any borders. An intervention means always a state is responsible uh, for a certain action in this uh, free flow of information. Um, and the interesting thing, and then I will uh, stop with explaining Article 10, but it's important to understand. The interesting thing, it's not only if the state directly, directly affects, does an action against the free flow of information uh, principle, but also if, for example, one private individual attacks another private individual and the state does not react on that. So there is also a kind of positive uh, obligation uh, of a member state uh, within the context of Article 10 to look that the individuals among themselves guarantee the free flow of information. Well, what is Council of Europe doing? Council of Europe plans um, to work on an instrument, uh, maybe, I don't know if it will be finalized, but we hope so, uh, in 2013 uh, on an instrument on border flow uh, across border flow of internet uh, traffic. Um, there was already some pre-work, the recommendation of the Committee of Ministers uh, from 2011 on the universality, integrity, and openness of the internet, which was exactly dealing with problems uh, we have just heard, uh, dealing uh, with, let's say, uh, all this question of blocking, filtering, uh, websites with monitoring of uh, traffic and so on. But we in the Council of Europe, we understand the term internet traffic more in this practical way. It's both content and information uh, carried by data packets. So of course our main focus always comes, uh, let's say, becomes priority or the priority question when uh, content cannot be delivered from one point uh, to another point. Um, the interesting fact is, I, I, I 
looked at that um, to prepare a little bit for this meeting. There are few cases only at the European Court on Human Rights which really deal with this aspect of transporter transport information transit. Um, there were, for example, one famous case many years ago, and the problem is quite similar, not similar in technical terms, but when satellite television came up, there was a famous case where the uh, court um, really uh, stressed the importance of transporter uh, freedom. And last but not least, I want to say from the side of an international lawyer, we have to be very clear that, for example, the prior consent principle, which means that the sovereignty of state may decide which content comes from outside, is still a principle of the ITU, uh, of the ITU law in Article 34, so prior concepts are the opposite of free flow of information. This is an uh, acknowledged principle, but there is no acknowledged principle, a duty between states themselves, among themselves, to respect free flow of information so far. They have to respect the individual, but there is no principle as a human, uh, as an international law principle so far of free flow of information. And that's, I think, what the Council of Europe, together with other organizations, especially here also with stakeholders, should work on. I am convinced that one day we need at a unilateral, global level, a binding principle of free flow of information. Thank you. Sorry, you mean a unilateral global? Multilateral. Multilateral. Sorry. I'm always checking no, the, uh, the transcript. I, I think I made a mistake, <laughs> but it's multilateral. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> because a unilateral system we can have easily. <laughs> Sorry. We That's can a draft joke. one right now, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we'll come back maybe a little bit later in the discussion on the exact formulation of the no transboundary harm principle of the uh, recommendation of the Council of Europe. Uh, what I would actually like now is to ask Anne Carblanc to uh, make the bridge with the, um, uh, the principles that uh, the Council, the um, OECD, sorry, have uh, developed, not only on uh, internet governance, but also potentially the applicability to the internet of some of the other principles that you've, uh, that you've developed. Anne. Thank you, Bertrand. Um, first of all, I can't resist. Um, to say that the OECD has been uh, highlighting the importance of the free flow of information starting in 1980, I guess like the Council of Europe, in the context of its first international instrument on privacy protection. It also reaffirmed uh, through a declaration in 1985 that it's absolutely essential to have this free flow of information to uh, promote economic growth and, and social prosperity. But more close to, closer to, to today's. Over the last 15 years, the OECD has been working on ICT and internet related uh, issues with a view to fostering growth, social welfare, and well being. The OECD has long been recognizing that the internet provides an open, decentralized platform which is really vital for communication, collaboration, innovation, creativity productivity improvement, economic growth, and I would also add expression of democratic rights. We have developed several non-binding instruments which cover broadband development, international roaming, privacy protection, uh, security of information systems and networks, protection of critical information infrastructures, consumer empowerment, protection of children, open access to public information, ICTs and the environment, and the list could be longer. Um, but in all these internet-related areas, jurisdiction, if we take jurisdiction as which body has the authority, which rules apply, and how a decision is enforced. So this issue of jurisdiction has always remained an outstanding issue. It proved, by the way, impossible to resolve through traditional avenues when we tried some 12 years ago to uh, progress on the issue of, of jurisdiction for the benefit of consumer policy, consumer protection and privacy protection. At that time, we began to think of turning to other options like alternative dispute resolution. As I may explain later on during the discussion, we have in fact 
in a very pragmatic manner, focused on developing and recommending a set of mechanisms like flexible arrangements, cooperation among governments in association with stakeholders to alleviate the issue of jurisdiction, whether it is to help ensure the free flow of information or cybersecurity for the economy and society or privacy protection. In, in June 2008 and in June 2011, the OECD has produced two broad, far-reaching instruments, a ministerial declaration on the future of the internet economy and a communique which was transformed later on into a council recommendation on principles for internet policy making. In these two instruments, there is a very clear recognition of the need for international cooperation among governments, business, civil society, and the technical community to address, and this is important, on a consensus basis, internet-related issues, and to develop policies to promote the continued growth um, of the economy and society while respecting individual rights in de democratic societies. I would like just to note that in the sole ministerial declaration, ministers agreed that um, the OECD should work in cooperation with other international organizations, and I quote, um, with all the stakeholders within fora such as the Internet Governance Forum, which I think we're very pleased to to participate this time. One more word about the communique on internet uh, policy principles. Um, it includes four, 14 broad principles which are designed to help preserve the fundamental openness of the internet while con concomitantly sorry for the <laughs> meeting some public uh, policy objectives. I said again, uh, I said already privacy, security, and so on. And I won't enter into details. By the way, I've put a, a, a pile of a summary of the principles here <coughs> on the table if you want to grab them. But one last thing that I would like to say, although we, we didn't hear precisely on the um, um, Council of Europe, how do you call it, no harm, um, minister's recommendation, but we have um, in our security guidelines, we, which are under review but date back to uh, 2002, a principle which I think is important in relation to the unintended or a fortiori, I would say, intended um, uh, action of some countries that have an impact uh, on another one, and it's the principle of ethics which says that participants should respect the legitimate interest of others and that given the pervasiveness of, of information systems and networks in our societies, participants, meaning governments, business, individuals, need to recognize that their action or their inaction can harm others. And ethical conduct is therefore crucial and participants should strive to develop and adopt best practices to promote conduct that recognizes security needs uh, and respect the legitimate interests of others. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, beyond the uh, sets of principles, we're touching here the role that uh, international organization, uh, and particularly in the case of the Council of Europe and the OECD, although they are intergovernmental organizations, I think it is um, interesting to give due credit to the efforts that they both make to engage the other type of stakeholders, not fully multi-stakeholder yet in any case, but they do uh, involve and participate with other actors. Uh, to finish the, the, the tour de table, I'd like to ask uh, Franklin Silvanetto from the uh, Brazilian government to, to give a perspective from a country that basically is, if I'm not mistaken, a very important geographical physical node for communication. Uh, networks, which has a large population that uses international <laughs> platforms and has operators on on its territory. How do you see this problem and uh, suggestions for international frameworks and approaches? Thank you, Bertrand, for the invitation and for the floor. Uh, I also beg apologies because my voice is also not very good. I, I think I have a... <laughs> Maybe it's my hotel room has something in the air. 
but uh, uh, I would like to, to give here the perspective from a country like uh, uh, Bertrand said that has some particularities. And uh, I would like to frame my works, uh, my, my words, especially in the historic perspective. And why is it important to, to stress that? Uh, because these issues related to the free flow of information and the cross-border flow of information are seen in Brazil uh, mainly as an issue that is related to the question of human rights. Uh, and uh, as everyone know, uh, Brazil until 1984, uh, from 64 to 1984, the political system was held by a dictatorship. And then the process of uh, redemocratization of Brazil, uh, it uh, passed very much by uh, the uh, updating of the whole uh, law and juridical system in order to uh, allow, uh, especially the judiciary system, of uh, means to hold uh, accountable, inclu including the state, for, uh, for violations of human rights. The first step in that direction was the Constitution in 1988, which is a constitution that starts by defining what are the, the, the basic principles and what are the basic uh, rights of the, of the human person in Brazil based on all the international instruments that Brazil was already a signatory. And I would mention in this case the Human Declaration of uh, Human Rights and the International Covenant of uh, uh, Civil and Political Rights. And uh, uh, th th this is a very important aspect to mention uh, because uh, the, this process is, uh, uh, was developing. And today, in Brazil, uh, we have two special pieces of uh, one legislation and one a set of, of principles that are followed by the government, which are uh, a result of this process that started with the red democratization and helps us understand why they are so much focused on the, on the issues of liberty of expression, liberty of communication, liberty of uh, and respect to human rights. And then I would mention the 10 principles of the Internet Steering Committee in Brazil and the civil framework of the Internet, which is a, a law that is, is being voted by Congress these days that was uh, presented to Congress by the executive branch of power and precisely aims to work and to function as a constitution of the internet in Brazil. And uh, the text of this uh, civil framework of the internet uh, is available uh, online, but you see that uh, it very much uh, seeks, when you seek the balance between uh, the freedom and uh, the security, it, it, it tries to, 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 to have uh, this uh, balance starting by the rights of the person, by the rights of the, of the people. And uh, in this sense, it is states very clearly that uh, the, uh, the, the use of the internet will be uh, guided by human rights principles. Uh, one very important uh, issue that I would like to mention here uh, was about this uh, positive uh, mention that uh, Mr. Matias uh, made about the, ne the need of a multilateral a treaty that could assure the, the, the free flow of uh, information. And then I would like to, to mention that uh, in the regional level, in the Americas, we have uh, an instrument uh, that says pre precisely that. So there is this uh, Inter-American Convention of, of Human Rights, which very much uh, has inspired itself on the global instruments of human rights, but in its Article 13, it states very clearly that uh, any person has the right to seek, to uh, send, and to receive information regardless of borders and regardless of the means that were uh, used uh, to that. And this precedes the internet. And then after the phenomenon of the internet uh, appeared, there was an, an interpretation by the Organization of American States, which, which held this, uh, this treaty, that these principles always re, uh, also refer to the, to the internet users. I mean, uh, so the, uh, the protection of the citizen to send and to seek and to receive information, uh, regardless of borders, uh, in the, uh, the inter-American inter -American context 
is already uh, uh, stated on a regional uh, treaty. Of course, one can always uh, argue, and it's a valid argument, that uh, the treaties and the laws are only uh, 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 pieces of, of paper. This is the criticism that we have, and I think it's a valid criticism. But apart from that, I do not see any other means by which you can ha ha hold the states accountable. Then I think it's very important that, uh, that uh, we have legislations, either in the international and in the internal level, that assures this, uh, uh, the rights for uh, uh, communication and assuring the rights of the, the free cross-border uh, flow of information. In this sense, I would like to mention the 10 principles of the Internet Steering Committee that starts the, uh, from the 10 principles, the, the three first of them mention the rights of people to, to have the information in the Internet, the liberty of expression and of access to the information in the Internet, uh, the respect of human rights, and also in the sixth or in the seventh principle, you also have the principle of uh, net neutrality, which is, apart from uh, other interpretations in Brazil, also interpreted as the, uh, uh, that the packets uh, should not be prioritized and should not be also uh, neutral in the sense that they, they cannot be blocked. Okay. Um, uh, one important aspect to mention as well, uh, opening the floor here to the debates, uh, um, and then one can ask, oh, so it means that in Brazil contents are never blocked or will never be blocked. And then there have been cases, and uh, the civil framework of the Internet uh, allows for these cases, but uh, it protects the ICPs, uh, the, IP, uh, the Internet service providers. They, are n uh, they won't be held accountable for the, for the, for the contents that uh, they, they transmit. And the blocking of contents can only be uh, allowed uh, by uh, judge decision. So it's not more in the hands of the executive branch of power to decide about that, but rather in the judiciary system, which, according to the uh, division of powers in Brazil and in, in, in most of countries, uh, is completely independent, although harmonic with the other two, two powers. So uh, these are my, uh, what I would like to, 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 to inform and then open to the questions. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Franklin. I'd like to move to uh, um, uh, an opening the floor to the audience. Maybe starting to ask if there is any remote participation question or any, no. So before we, you have one question, go, go ahead. <laughs> Michael. Um, well, yeah, I have a, uh, <clears throat> a question to, to Robert. Uh, Robert, you were talking about upstream filtering and uh, did you make any uh, um, research on what it means if there is tunneling? Does this work even if you have data packets packed into other data packets and then you do upstream filtering? Are you with a deep packet inspection so fast to get in the very inside? May, may I ask that you, you just keep the question as one of the questions for, for the rest? If you want to ask another question, uh, you seem to have another one. No? Uh, I have a remark. Another okay. remark. Can you? We'll come back to it afterwards. Thank you very much for your understanding. <laughs> so um, let me open the floor to the uh, to, to the to, to the room. I would ask you either to ask a question if there is something you didn't really understand, or maybe to give your thoughts about the type of ways forward, because we have spent the first part to explain what are the types of problems we're facing, the objectives that everybody shares. But how can we move forward? Is it multilateral agreements? Is it agreements at the more local level? Is it uh, national decisions? Or is it cooperation between the actors? If you have any ideas about that, don't hesitate to, uh, to, to open. And please, uh, we would like to ask a question or make a comment. Go ahead. Uh, can we have a mic? Microphone? Any other uh, person who would like to make a comment in the room? Okay. Uh, this is Martin Levy from 
Hurricane Electric, uh, we run a large IP backbone and we also do an enormous amount of monitoring of the BGP routing. So this is a, a response to, to, to some of the things that Robert talked about. Um, first off, unfortunately, it's the wrong time of day to ping Tom, who wrote the, uh, Tom Pesek from, from um, Cloudflare, who wrote the blog about what happened in Indonesia. But I'm happy to say that, that if you read his blog, three minutes fixed the problem once they saw it. It was an operator error. But yes, it should be protected. And there's an RPKI session on Friday, unfortunately the last thing on Friday, uh, which will discuss the pluses and minuses of the technology to solve this. Ignoring Indonesia and going on to a more generic response, the issue on um, routing and filtering, I'm going to throw a small commercial comment back. Take a random country in Southeast Asia that can route upwards towards the mentioned China or downwards towards the ocean where undersea cables exist, and they have an option. They have a commercial option to, to buy their internet connectivity to the rest of the world. And in the case uh, 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 shown there, if they go up and they end up in a country that may or may not have filtering for the, their packets, that's a commercial choice because they can go down and connect through um, classic uh, uh, telecom hubs such as Singapore or Hong Kong. These have been very commercially successful hubs for, um, for internet traffic. This, I, I, my, my, my simple point to make is that there are commercial choices. And um, knowing how that connectivity works and having uh, uh, looked at it, um, every one of those countries pretty much has a choice outside of obvious ones such as a landlocked country. Um, and, and therein lies a more interesting point. So therefore, it is not a moot point. I'm not uh, taking away, but it is an issue. Um, and then somebody else asked about tunneling. Yes, tunneling can be seen in, in a DPI. That's a simple technical response from the PDF file of somebody selling a, a DPI box. Yes, we can look at tunnels. Um, but tunnels can get pretty complicated. So where there's a where there's a problem, there can sometimes be a solution as well. That's all, just comments. Thank, thank you. Um, unless there are other questions in, in the room, uh, I will ask a few questions myself to, or comments from the panel, and maybe that's a good opportunity for Robert also to answer, Michael. Um, Milton. Well, I just thought Martin's comments were very good, and uh, they sort of reflected some of the, my own questions about the, uh, there's, there's different mindsets here. There's the mindset that says, we, if we have an interstate problem, we want to solve it with an intergovernmental treaty. And there's the mindset that it's an operational problem, and if you fix a configuration, it's over in three minutes. Uh, and I'm wondering how those two mesh here. Very, very fair point. I'll come back to that. Robert, if you want to answer um, Michael's um, question, or maybe I, I, I will. I make. So, in terms of the testing that that we do, is what we do is uh, the technical interrogation is basically what a simple user would experience. Um, and so, um, yes, you can use uh, tunneling, you can use VPNs, you can use circumvention tools. Our assumption is that most people, what's their internet experience like, and what they're going to see. And so, the testing that we've seen and the examples that I cited is. Um, the testing tool that we have just basically saw um, some blocking taking place, and then we take a look at it. Um, and as, you know, there's slightly different examples as to where it's taking place. Um, I think uh, I just want to raise something. If we're having a policy discussion that I didn't hear, which uh, as a Canadian um, I, I needed to raise, is the issue of privacy in transborder data flows. And yeah. the reason I mention that as a Canadian is that. Um, we have great internet in Canada, but sometimes it's cheaper to put data in the U.S., um, but the U.S. has laws that um, allow access to any data that's stored in the U.S., Patriot Act, and um, a lot of the privacy, of, um, because we have privacy protections in Canada that um, aren't, don't, do not exist to the same extent in the U.S., these privacy bodies, be it the federal privacy commissioner's office that have written extensively about this, or the provincial bodies, have instructed the government, yes, you can do transborder data flows. However, um, um, the privacy of the citizens will be impacted if that's the case. So please store the data in Canada, even though it might be more expensive. So that's in terms of the commercial aspects, I think that's the other thing, too. If there are other policy imperatives, 
that for national security reasons or for privacy reasons, um, um, you know, so it's going to be hard. So we're going to have to include privacy in that as well too. And and you know, the writing, the other part of the routing question was answered. But I would say that also for the commercial choices that kind of came up in terms of where they're getting their access, um, maybe selling another set of panels that have been discussed about you know, um, here in, in at the IGF more generally is that this is very important point because if countries around the world and companies want to promote internet freedom, then they're also, if they're providing connectivity and it's too expensive, then other countries that may not um, have as open and uncensored an internet also are entering into the market, um, then one has to take that in mind too. And so is it a level playing field or not? And so if China subsidizes the connectivities, it does because it has maybe other deals with the countries as well, we're going to have an issue. And so are there trade barriers that need to go up if a country uh, does not subsidize a blocked internet? So that's an issue maybe to discuss. Matthias, you wanted to, to, say, to say something, and I will ask a question to you afterwards. <laughs> Maybe you ask your question first. <laughs> OK. My question was a little bit provocative uh, regarding the non-transboundary harm principle. Because on the one hand, it's a very powerful principle, and I'm well placed to know that I like it. On the other hand, you mention another rule which says that there is a responsibility of state not only for their own actions, but potentially for non-action mm -hmm. on something that happens on their territory mm -hmm. that may have a transboundary impact. Mm -hmm. This is all nice in a democratic country. Right. In a non-democratic country, how can that or couldn't that be used as an alibi to require or to justify surveillance measures by the governments to make sure that there is no transboundary impact? Yes. I mean, this question is, of course, it's provocative, but it's a very old question that you always can ask what what sense does law have or written rules have if there are non-democratic uh, practices in the in a state so uh, the problem always is that what law wants and how is it finally understood are two different pair of shoes but what i just want to repeat is um, of course you're right franklin that you on the inter-american level but especially also we in europe we have, of course, this principle of free flow of information in the way of transponder information. Um, that's maybe then a, a legal question, but for me it's, it's a little bit weird that in international law, and for example, Mr. Weber is there as an international lawyer, uh, can maybe, maybe add something on that. But in international law, we have an acknowledged principle of sovereignty of states of consent of state, what happens in the uh, territory, but we have no, let's say, binding principle, which among states themselves, yes, they have to re respect, of course, the individual rights of the individual, but there is no principle like one state to the other has to respect the free flow of information. Of course, it's very li linked to the individual. And therefore, this no harm principle, uh, Bertrand, you, you are asking for, um, in the exercise of their sovereignty rights, and this is, I think, what it's about. Um, states should refrain from any action that would directly or indirectly harm persons or entities outside of their territorial jurisdiction. And when you ask now, Petro, good, it's good on paper. I think one of the big advantages that we have on the European level is we have the European Court on Human Rights. And really, I was just in the workshop with Mr. Fatolayev, uh, who was criticizing the Azerbaijanian government some years ago for the external policy, had to go to jail, was in jail four years, and it was the European Court on Human Rights that finally decided for Mr. Fatulayev because he complained there. And, well, we could happily have him to today, and he even won the UNESCO Freedom uh, Prize. Um, we have freedom of uh, without transponders in the in the international convenient convenient on human right uh, convenient on social political and whatever rights in the in the United Nations but for example there is no real effective mechanism why not even not the United States for example have ratified it so far so 
what we have, and this is one of the things why IGF, to my mind, is so important, to say we have a lot of rights, we have a lot of written, but we, we need more effectiveness. And there, I think, the system of the Council of Europe with the court is a very good example. I don't know how it's in the inter-American possibilities, if there is also then this court which can really do sanctions. Uh, but I think this is one of the issues we have to talk about. Thank you. Th thank you very much. I, I take the opportunity to recognize in the audience Rolf Weber and Christian Singer, uh, who with myself were in part of the drafting group that helped elaborate, um, and Mikhail, sorry, <laughs> Yankuchev, that we were in the, in the working group that produced this uh, uh, recommendation that was submitted to the Council of Ministers. Uh, it was in no way a criticism of the principle, just wanted to highlight the point you went to, which is actual implementation and corollaries like uh, uh, proportionality, due process, and, and that sort of thing in the, uh, in the implementation. I'd be interested, though, to, to see whether other organizations would be interested or other countries would be interested to try to s spread this principle of no transboundary harm. And do you want to say something? Um, yes, thank you. As I said earlier, we, we have something which is very similar in our security guidelines, which are currently under review. So we could consider um, whether this would be something to be, um, let's say, further clarified. But I, I want to say that the internet and internet-related issues um, are very complex issues and there are different layers, there are different players, there are countries are at different levels of development. Some are democratic countries with a long history and, and they're ready to uh, take some steps to further perhaps uh, strengthen human rights for instance, others are less advanced. Uh, what we do at the OECD, and that's the Anglo-Saxon, I'm French, so that's the Anglo-Saxon uh, pragmatism, which I think has some virtue. So we try to bring, to, to work in parallel on different tracks. We don't think that there is one solution. We don't think that a global treaty is going to solve the issues. We don't think that only codes of conduct, voluntary codes of conduct, by ISPs, for instance, are going to solve the issue. But what we have learned is that we need a mix. We need a mix of education and awareness. We need a mix of regulation. We need a mix of self-regulation. And probably, personally, I think, and I was a judge by background, but I think that the, the decisions and the solutions which have the, the, the most important uh, chance to be implemented are the ones which are consensus-based and multi-stakeholder, because if you bring people at the table and they participate to creating a decision, then they're ready to implement it. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Franklin, you wanted to, uh, to comment and maybe also take the opportunity to, uh, to address the question of should it be, if there are some sort of agreement, should they be global, should they be regional, should they be combinations of different tools and instruments okay uh, uh, certainly this uh, issue of um, uh, transborder harm is one of the many uh, challenges that uh, the traditional international politics is facing with the phenomenon of the internet absolutely yeah, I say this is one of them and uh, just to name another few or another <laughs> the, the question of sovereignty itself it's one of the main and core principles in international uh, politics that the internet uh, phenomenon came to challenge and states are having to, to, to address this in an appropriate manner and innovative manner, which is quite a challenge. Uh, uh, regarding the, 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 uh, the possibility of having treaties and uh, if they should be global or regional, my personal view is that uh, in the case of internet, if uh, anything is not uh, discussed in a global basis, it, it does not, uh, uh, the chances of uh, this having success are, are lesser. I mean, w w what do I want to say? That in, in the internet uh, space, uh, if you do not discuss and have an, uh, an understanding in global level, because the internet is global, has no borders. So uh, what is not accorded in global level won't, will, will not work. 
But then comes the, 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 the issue of the sanctions that Matthias uh, trained me. International law is interesting because of that. It has no sanctions. You do not see in a treaty, if the country does not fulfill this, it will go to, to where? To, to prison. You know? The sanction in international uh, law is the peer sanction. You know? the, 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 the country can be uh, either excluded or can be either uh, sanctioned in the sense of the, what the other countries will do in relation to that. But the international uh, law has a very important role on also defining internal laws. Uh, in the case of Brazil, an international treaty has the force of a national law when the government signs a treaty. And in this sense, it can orientate the, uh, uh, the, the, the drafting or crafting of what we call uh, uh, infranational law. I mean, uh, you have this law in this level, and then up, uh, starting from this, guideline, then you can have a law with sanctions in the domestic level. And then in, in this sense, I think uh, uh, international treaties could be, uh, even though they're so difficult to discuss and to negotiate, especially treaties regarding to the internet, which is a new phenomenon. And uh, as I said, everything has to be uh, agreed globally. But uh, they have uh, this capacity of also triggering internal processes that will result in more respect to, in the case that we are discussing here, more respect to, to freedom and to, and to respect of uh, the rights to send and receive information, do no harm to the, to the others. The, uh, the point you make is, is related to what Matthias was saying, which is the uh, enforcement and the sanction mechanisms. At the same time, there are some treaties that have uh, not necessarily sanctions mechanisms, but are precisely making dispute resolution mechanisms as part of it. The strongest is the European Court of Human Rights on a regional basis, but the WTO arrangements for alternative dispute resolutions. The question I would like to, to ask, maybe a bit provocatively, is when you're talking about the global um, treaty or arrangement, isn't there a tension between the desire of legitimacy that requires that the whole international community discusses those things and the difficulty on such principles to have any likelihood of agreement that can be operationalized and include enough sanctions? In other terms, is there a sort of intermediary path that should be uh, searched between the principle of starting any discussion in absolutely universal frameworks and the alternative which is very small minilateral discussions or regional discussions is there a critical mass of actors is the combination of i don't know apec oecd and council of europe and Afri american states represent a significant mass they want to discuss together can there be an intermediary pass or is does it have necessarily to be in a universal un framework well, uh, like I said, uh, international treaties can be a very cumbersome process to, to, be, to be finished and to be negotiated. And, uh, uh, and, and then, uh, and I'm not stating here that everything has to be regulated by international treaty, I mean. I think they have uh, a very important uh, effect that I mentioned already, that they can trigger internal processes. And then, uh, of course, especially in the internet realm, uh, many, uh, uh, many uh, issues can be solved in the technical level and the internet is working like that I mean it's uh, <laughs> it has always worked well uh, being uh, like that but uh, uh, the if you come to the state uh, level and if something is agreed to be uh, negotiated in the state level and then uh, again I repeat uh, I think the processes that are negotiated globally have uh, more uh, uh, chances of success, especially because the states that have been outside the negotiation process, later on when they're called to, to join that uh, instrument or that treaty, they can always say, look, I did not take part in this negotiation, so it does not, uh, you see? So uh, it's cumbersome, but sometimes uh, it's the only way. It's always the vicious circle. Michael, you wanted to, to make a is the, uh, the microphone available over there? Yes. 
I am Michael Yakushev. I am representing Russian uh, internet community. And I would like somehow uh, try to answer to the questions of Bertran. And our country is the country which implemented a very strict uh, system of uh, internet censorship starting from November the 1st. So it's a very recent experience and it's a very unfortunate experience because I always was proud that uh, our country was uh, all with very free internet without any uh, no restrictions uh, while we have uh, uh, such system uh, right now and no one uh, can guarantee that it will not be used for certain politi political purposes and not for the purposes that it is uh, intended from the very beginning. So uh, I would say that uh, for my country, for our foreign ministry, the problems of uh, uh, cross-border harm was never a priority. And that's why our work within the Council of Europe was so important, because Russia is a part of the Soviet uh, Council, of, uh, Council of Europe. Yes, because it's in, in Russian, it's Soviet Europe, in the Council of Europe. And that's why our soft law, which we developed in our group, and it was uh, confirmed by the Cabinet of Ministers, it was uh, just uh, a very good uh, example for Russia, which is part of the uh, uh, system of the Council of Europe. And um, I, of course, I think uh, we should make it a priority. Uh, Russia proposed different uh, uh, conventions and concept of conventions aimed at uh, infor information security or international information security, and it even signed a convention, uh, or so-called Yekaterinburg Convention on uh, Information Security with China, with Tajikistan, and with Turkmenistan. Uh, I don't know uh, much about uh, their intentions and uh, uh, what happens in China, but of course for the Russian internet community, uh, we all know what happens in Tajikistan and Turkmenistan, and we're not quite happy with uh, the attempts that we should have the same direction as our colleagues and neighbors from Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. And we would rather be oriented to the example of the uh, Council of Europe, of uh, the Western countries, and so on and so forth. So uh, I think, answering your question, Bertrand, that of course, uh, I'm also an international lawyer by profession, that we should try uh, to develop an international legal instrument. And of course, um, uh, universal convention would be preference. But um, as the regional uh, legislative process has already started, I think uh, we should also try this way as well. And maybe it would be a great idea for Russia to join a convention which can be developed within the framework of the Council of Europe. And it should be aimed not on the improvement of uh, the principle of sovereignty, but to the improvement of the principle of uh, cross-border harm. And uh, I would make a reference to such branches of the international law as an outer space law, uh, as the nuclear safety law or in environmental law, where, for example, uh, the sovereign country cannot blow up uh, nuclear weapons on their own territory, even if, for example, if they want to splash a riot or the, just to stop the uh, public disturbance in certain areas of this country, because it will immediately uh, make certain uh, cross-border harm. So as for the sanctions, I think it's not necessarily to discuss the, the sanctions right now. Maybe it can be uh, the next stage. And a lot of international documents, they don't include any provisions on the sanctions. But uh, what I think uh, is necessary is to implement the real mighty stakeholderism principle in the process of developing such uh, international legal document. And uh, I think we need the support from the technical experts from the private sector and from the civil society to uh, describe where is the real border which we cannot step, where uh, any legislative measures taken by a certain country will not uh, harm the infrastructure of the internet as we know it. Because no one can predict what will happen with the full implementation of the IPv6 or the NSEC, uh, how DPI systems in the, uh, will would work uh, with uh, uh, the packets of IPv6 protocol, etc., etc. So all these, they're open questions, and I think maybe we were not very precise and very concrete in our work within the Council of Europe while describing what exactly can be considered the harm, uh, the cross-border harm, and this is exactly what we can do all together in the next couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. We are, we are uh, reaching the, uh, the, the final minutes of this uh, session as we started just a little bit late.
partly due to my fault, uh, will get uh, five minutes uh, more. I would like, in, in conclusion, to ask maybe the different panelists, maybe starting uh, with Franklin, uh, if they can contribute a very, very short uh, statement. And ideally, if you had one or two or three bullet points somehow or expressions that struck you during the discussion that you find a different way of addressing the problem than the formulations that you were accustomed to that would be extremely useful for any kind of reporting that we do afterwards uh, if we can try to be very very short but please have a last one minute um, each conclusion no, uh, yes uh, if, I, if i could define or, or, or pinpoint one uh, is uh, these uh, issues are so challenging to the states. Uh, uh, this question that, uh, I mean, uh, the states in this case should also be, uh, should also be called on uh, resolving how not to do the harm abroad, you know? Mm -hmm. It was very useful, the mention that was made by the, 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 the Russian uh, colleague on this, I mean, the example of the, the uh, non-proliferation non treaty, you know, that the countries uh, cannot, you know? Good so th there are limits, including to what the countries can do uh, within their borders. I mean, and this is a this is quite a, 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 a difficult task that should be addressed by, by the government. Thank you, Milton. Well, I'm <coughs> an international, not an international lawyer, and I uh, have made it a point to think about internet governance uh, as independently of the institution of the nation state as possible. Uh, and I'm really uh, intrigued by this discussion um, because uh, in, in one way it just seems strangely incongruous to be talking about these transporter operational problems as if a treaty process could actually address them when we're, again, talking about configuration errors that happen for 30 minutes or, or, or so. And then thinking more along the same lines that you're thinking, I'm wondering if the whole thing could backfire by uh, making... Um, making states responsible for too much uh, that if the U.S. can blame, uh, let's say, uh, let's take a nice little vulnerable country, uh, I don't know, let's say uh, Romania, for uh, having uh, too many cyber criminals in it uh, and uh, they're violating the principle of transporter harm, uh, can, what do we do, send in the Marines and uh, take over their infrastructure? Is that, is that, are we creating a justification for doing that? I'm, so I'm wondering about whether in attempting to grapple with the problems of a non-sovereign space, using the principles and instruments of sovereignty, whether there's some gigantic uh, electromagnetic negation that takes place and uh, all of the states just disappear in a poof. I, I'm not sure that was the solution proposed. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yes, thank you. I would say that um, it's interesting to see the discussion, which it's pretty often um, the same. In fact, I wasn't struck by anything particular. The, the question of whether we should have a treaty uh, or whether we should uh, try to have uh, uh, operational solutions uh, is, is pretty frequent. Again, I would say that probably the most effective way to advance is to foster interoperability also of of laws and uh, let's say policy frameworks and perhaps it doesn't sound ambitious not to go to the UN for a treaty but it's very important that everywhere as much as possible there is a protection of human rights but there is also something that we that was mentioned I think by the representative of Google and maybe Bertrand that uh, we shouldn't forget that the internet is this open platform which is fantastic and which is bringing uh, economic growth and prosperity and we need to preserve it and of course we also need to preserve the human rights but we shouldn't forget that uh, prosperity in many countries is absolutely essential Miguel there were black sheep were mentioned not with these words but um, <laughs> someone talked about um, internet service providers in uh, changing BGP routing or interfering with BGP routing. I would call under the circumstances, as they were mentioned, um, they were black sheep. And you have, in every industry, you have black sheep, no, no doubt about it. But 
the same black sheep can help Russia on what uh, Mikhail said um, to overcome any uh, overblocking on the border. Uh, because if you have negotiations between ISPs on a technical basis, um, there's n no, no sanction sanctions or whatsoever will help if these guys communicate technically and, uh, and, and do some, um, some specific uh, arrangements. Um, that was one point. Another point, and, and that was so something which I will take up uh, to bring to um, Dubai uh, in, in December, uh, Anne said, and she made a very good distinction between ICT and Internet. And those are totally different things. And currently, the ITU, with, with their um, new regulation uh, uh, coming up in, in, in December, is always uh, taking the Internet into the ICT, uh, or trying to say ICT, including the Internet. The problem here is the discussion today would have been totally different if we have talked about ICT and including the internet because then all the hardware with backdoors and software with backdoors would have been to be discussed in, in uh, un, under these is issues and relating it to internet made it a little bit less complicated and um, that's that's something new the distinction explicit distinction from the OECD between ICT and internet what I take back thank you Yala. Yeah, I just want to expand on the uh, the trade agreement point of view because it didn't get um, much of an airing. And uh, the Korea-USA uh, free trade agreement specifically recognizes the importance of the free flow of information in, in facilitating uh, trade. And it commits those two countries to refrain from imposing uh, or maintaining unnecessary barriers to, to those flows. Um, uh, interestingly, these same principles are getting traction in uh, bilateral uh, principles agreed between U.S. and Japan and U.S. and EU, so it seems to be gaining some momentum. Uh, and there's a trade um, dialogue going on in the Asia-Pacific region at the moment. It's called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, and those same principles uh, are on the table there. But many countries seem to be rather lukewarm or reluctant to uh, progress those, and I think in part it's, it's what Robert said about worries about privacy. Uh, uh, of the data that's crossing borders and also perhaps uh, security. So uh, those elements uh, can also have an impact uh, in terms of policy frameworks around cross-border data flows. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me just, uh, a couple things that I've heard for, from everyone um, as, as well as my comments is I would just say that um, it's all very complex. I mean, as the internet um, is a network of network and we're all interconnected in a far more robust and resilient way, we find out that the data flows um, and where connectivity comes from is not as simple as it used to be. It's far more complex. And choices matter. Uh, it's not just about cost. Um, yeah. You can choose where to get your data from and that will impact things. And I would say that um, you know, uh, as an academic or if with an academic institution, I think we need more data. Um, we need people, there are good people that have worked on this, um, and they need to be able to share not, for example, cross-border flows between Canada and the U.S., what's happening between, for example, cross-border data between Europe and outside of Europe and between Asia Pacific. And I would say then if we identify problems, um, as is the case, is what are the oversight bodies? Um, not necessarily a framework, but it's just where do people go if they find there's a problem? And I would say that some of the solutions is something that the IGF and ICANN and other is that the technologists, if they make mistakes, can have a huge impact and take sites completely offline. And we need to make sure that the technical capacity is there, that small problems or small blocking or other things can have a huge impact. So I would say it's a technologist, it's about choices that matter, um, and we really need to document and share. Thank you. Matthias, last word. Uh, just to make it sure, although I was uh, having some, expressing some sympathies for international law and instruments, I'm of course strongly supporting 
uh, all that what uh, Anne, for example, said of the code of conduct and also especially the multi-stakeholderalism, which we mention here nearly every day several times. So this is absolutely true and certainly an international instrument wouldn't be the only solution. Just wanted to make it clear. But your doubts, Milton, with the state, I understand this very well because there are many states who say when they have responsibility, this is a danger for the citizens. The understanding, and that's what I just wanted to say, of the European Court of Human Rights is, who is the last guarantor on pluralism? And that's the state. Because finally, you complain when you do not have your freedom, your pluralism, whatever you say. Look, and the state is, is looking at that and is doing nothing. And that's what I wanted to express, of course. Um, I'm sure, and I'm not convinced that we will ever have an international binding instrument, but I think uh, a, a very tough international, let's say, at least political expression of the freedom of information is very updated today, and this will be supported by the Council of Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much to all. I will, I will take advantage of my last minute to highlight a few words that I've that I've picked during the uh, during the discussion. The first word that I would say is important is actually geography and topology. In as much as the network is using a non-geographically based addressing system, comments about landlocked countries, where you get your connectivity from, show that geography still matter even in the physical uh, aspect. And the, uh, the fascinating concept that was mentioned, are we going to see a subsidized controlled internet is, is something that I think is a very valid question in terms of the influence and political influence of some countries regarding the uh, connectivity that they provide to other places. The second thing is the relationship between sovereignty and responsibility. The very interesting, uh, I, mean, I think Franklin mentioned the important word sovereignty and the non transboundary arm principle and what Michael also mentioned is that there are limits to the absolute exercise of sovereignty including on the territory of a country and therefore in particular when there is an impact on, on other actors. The other word, the third word I would like to mention is the term unintended consequences. There are many issues that we've addressed that are unintended consequences that are more related to unawareness than to the desire to impact uh, cro across borders. However, there are cases where there's an intentional extraterritorial impact, and this is a whole other debate, but it can apply, for instance, on the DNS and on the blocking at the DNS level. Um, which then leads to the, the final uh, point, or the final word, is the notion of principles, instruments, and tools. And this apparently emerging notion that there's no one single uh, tool that will solve that sort of problems. Nobody knows if it is one international agreement or just mere guidelines or operations and agreements between the different operators, but it is clearly an important element to combine high-level principles and enforcement tools in any, in any case or operationalizing uh, instruments. And in that regard, uh, just an advertisement, we have, as you know, uh, for the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, two workshops that will explore this in further detail on Thursday and Friday. The uh, document was in your bag. One announcement, the workshop on Friday is likely to be moved to the, on geography of cyberspace, it's likely to be moved to the beginning of the afternoon to avoid conflicting with the taking stock and the way forward. I thank you very, very much. I hope you appreciated the, uh, the session. It was a pleasure to moderate it and have a good end of the afternoon.